Okay, so this will be the discussion portion of lab 22, which is red blood cells and blood typing. So we'll go ahead and look at the various aspects of it. Um, we won't uh, review the uh, red blood cell characteristics. Uh, we looked at these, though, in, in lecture. Um, um, I guess we can do them quickly. Uh, red blood cells are biconcave discs. Uh, the biconcavity, which we see right here, right, decreases the surface area, which allows more absorption. That helps to speed the, up the diffusion. 70% um, of our, sorry, uh, a large portion of our oxygen, 97% of our oxygen is carried inside a red blood cell. Um, and 23% of our CO2 is carried inside a red blood cell. Um, they're very flexible. They can squeeze through narrow vessels. Um, they are a nucleate, so notice right here, the red blood cell is ex extruding its nucleus right here, um, and that maximizes the space for hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a protein that allows us to carry oxygen. Um, if you have a immature red blood cell uh, that gets put in the circulation, it's called a reticulocyte. So we see it right here, reticulocyte. And as we said before, red blood cells are um, functioned uh, to be able to carry gases primarily. Now they also help do other things like buffer, uh, pH, and things like that. Um, so uh, most of uh, this is going to come from Fox 6.1, but we're also going to see Fox 6.3. So in Fox 6.1, we did what's called a total red blood cell count. Um, you're going to use a hemocytometer. Hemo refers to blood cyto cell meter counter. And what you're going to do is you're going to put the red blood cells in a solution. Uh, that solution is going to lyse the right white blood cells. Then you're going to put a cover slip on, which this picture doesn't show, uh, onto the hemocytometer. It's a special glass cover slip. And then you're going to slowly fill up the silver portion. So you can see the little tabs right there, the slide cover would sit on top of it and you would fill it up with the cells. When you looked under the microscope, you would see this grid. It's actually a uh, well that fills up with a very specific amount of blood. And then when you looked under the microscope, eventually um, at the 400 times magnification, you would see something like this. This square actually corresponds to just number five right here. So that's it, just number five right here. Um, and basically you would count all of the red cells here, every cell that you see are the red cells. And when you counted all of these red cells, you'd come out to about a hundred ish, which is pretty typical. Most of these in a normal person would have somewhere between 80 and 120 red cells each. Um, theoretically, you're supposed to count all five. I can tell just by the way this is, this is in the middle, so this would be number five. You'd also have to count one, two, three, and four. You would add those numbers up, and then you would multiply it by 10,000. The reason why you multiply 10,000 has to do with the dilution factor and the volume of each one of these wells. Once you did that, the total, so let's say as an example, um, you had 100 in each one of these, right? So your total would be 100, 100, 100, 100. 100 for each one, although it's unlikely. You add them all up, that would be 500. You multiply by 10,000, and that would give you about 5 million red cells. So that would be a normal count. Men tend to be a little higher. Women tend to be a little lower, but that's how you count them. The hematocrit is known as the packed red cell volume. To get that, remember, we took a whole blood. We filled up a capillary tube. Uh, we filled it with blood as much as we could, capped one end, stuck it in a centrifuge, spun it very quickly. The red cells go to the bottom. The middle portion is the buffy coat. That's the white blood cells and the platelets. And the upper portion is the plasma and all the things dissolved in plasma. And there's a number of different ways that you can measure this. There's uh, these fancy, work very well, microcapillary readers like this. Um, you could actually put it on a special card where you line up the bottom and top and then run the red line across to where the 
uh, red blood cells end and get the number there. Or you could literally just measure the distance from one end of the tube to the other of the entire blood volume and then measure how much of that the red blood cells took and just take a percentage. Um, the average percentage of hematocrit is about somewhere around 42. So nobody use, use, uses, uses a percent very often, but it's about 42%. Again, men tend to be on the higher side, women tend to be on the lower. The range for women is typically given as like 37 to 47, and men are like 42 to 52. Um, uh, regardless of that, anybody who has a hematocrit less than 37 would be said to have anemia. So that's how we uh, do that. We see that uh, hemoglobin uh, is an important component of red cells. As I mentioned before, we basically scoop all the cellular components out, shove it as full of hemoglobin as we can. The average red cell has somewhere in the neighborhood of about 280 million hemoglobin molecules on it. And that equals about 14 grams per deciliter in terms of hemoglobin. Uh, not worried about the structure too much. Uh, it's a protein that's called a tetramere. It's got two alpha and two beta subunits. And the key is each one of those subunits has a heme group. So there's one, two, three, four heme groups that all can carry oxygen. And again, its major functions carry oxygen. It does carry CO2. And we can also help buffer uh, changes in pH with uh, hemoglobin as well. Uh, Hemoglobin carry um, many gases that I just mentioned. It can carry oxygen that's carried on the heme, right? So that's called oxyhemoglobin. Uh, we put that in red because when oxygen binds to the iron portion of heme, it becomes oxidized and it turns red. When oxygen is not being carried by hemoglobin, it's called deoxyhemoglobin. Um, and that turns blue, or what we call cyan. That's where the word cyanosis comes from. That's often an indication medically there's low oxygen. Um, the carbon dioxide is carried a little differently. It's carried actually on the amino acid itself. And so to signify that, we call it carb for carbon dioxide, amino, because it's carried on the amino acid residual, hemoglobin. So carb amino hemoglobin is what we call a hemoglobin molecule carrying CO2. And then the last one is uh, carbon monoxide, right? So just CO, carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is a dangerous gas, right? And you know, every year you can always often hear stories of someone dying from carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, and if it's carrying carbon monoxide, we call it carboxyhemoglobin. So make sure you understand the difference between oxy, deoxy, carb amino, and carboxyhemoglobin uh, for lecture and lab. We measured hemoglobin in lab by a special method called the Talquist method. The Talquist method is not extremely precise, but it tends to give us pretty good numbers. Um, and what you do is you basically just saturate a bond paper um, with blood, let it dry, and then use the chart to match the color. Um, the problem is the chart's hard to interpret sometimes, and you actually have to interpret it in natural light uh, as well. But uh, anybody less than 12, which would be right about here on this one, uh, would be uh, considered to be anemic. Um, and you just have to sometimes take your best guess, because unless it matches the color exactly, let's say you had this and it was somewhere between 12.5 and, and 14.1, then you know that it's somewhere in there, but is it closer to 12.5, is it closer to 14.1? You just kind of kind of guesstimate that. But, you know, usually people get pretty close, and if you measured it multiple ways, this is, you know, uh, usually uh, fairly consistent. Uh, you're not going to get some really weird number uh, based on that, like you might measure it some other way. So Talquist method, pretty quick and easy uh, to do, and that's why we do it. Um, the other point to make, is we have a what is often called a hematocrit to hemoglobin ratio and your hematocrit usually is about three times your hemoglobin so as an example uh, our normal hematocrit we said was 42 and our normal hemoglobin is 14 and if you divide 42 by 14 you'll get three so it doesn't work all the time but usually they're fairly close 
Now, we can use those measures to measure something called the mean corpuscular volume, or MCV. That's a measure of the average cell size. And when we look at the average cell size, uh, we have this formula uh, to measure it. So MCV is the total red blood cell volume, okay, divided by the number of red blood cells. And we have to kind of uh, maneuver this formula a little bit to get there. So as an example, the MCV, and again, you don't have to learn this. We're not going to worry about this value per se in lecture. Uh, we talked about micro, normal, and macrocytic in lecture, but we didn't talk about how to calculate the MCV. Um, so we'll just save that for lab. That's why we're doing it here. So MCV is the hematocrit times 10 over the red blood cell count in millions. So going back to the number we had earlier, we said an average hematocrit was 42. So 42 times 10 is 420. Remember, our red blood cell count was exactly 5 million. So 420 divided by 5 is 84. So my MCV would be 84. Once you get your MCV value, then like most of the things we do in lab, you have to compare it to the normal value. The normal value for uh, MCV is 82 to 92. We're not going to worry about the units. And so basically, uh, we would uh, say, oh, we're normal because we fall within that range. 84 is between 82 and 92. If it's normal, then we use the root word cytic for MCV. Okay? So we'd call it normocytic. And normal cytic is 82 to 92. If the number was less than 82, below 82, we'd call it microcytic, that's small cell size. And if it was above 92, that would be macrocytic, and that would be a large cell size. And uh, certain anemias are characterized by how uh, big the cells are. So as an example, the most common anemia, sometimes known as uh, iron deficiency anemia, or used to be called nutritional anemia because it usually came from nutrition, although we don't do it anymore because it can be caused by other things. But if you have cells that are too small, that's associated with that would be microcytic. But uh, there's a um, type of anemia called pernicious anemia. And that is characterized by large or the normal cell size. And that's usually mac macrocytic. So those are important values in order to talk about the, the cell size. Now we can also measure the amount of hemoglobin in it. And so that's what MCHC is. That stands for mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration. It's a similar calculation. Again, this is lab, so I'd have to give you the calculation on a lab exam, right? But it's uh, hemoglobin concentration times 100 divided by hematocrit. So to go back to our normal numbers again, we said, oh, a normal hemoglobin is 14. So 14 times 100 is 1,400 divided by that normal hematocrit we had before, 42, All right? So 1,400 divided 42 is 33.3, .3, right? And so based on that, we again look at what's normal. The normal range is 32 to 36. Again, we're not going to worry about the units here. Um, and so uh, the term we associate with hemoglobin concentration is chromic because chromic refers to color and hemoglobin gives the cell color, right? So if it's normochromic, like our number is, 33.3 .3 is between 32 and 36, we call it normochromic. If it's below 32, that means there's not enough hemoglobin, so that would be hypochromic. And if it's above uh, 36, there's excessive hemoglobin, that's hyperchromic. So as an example, again, that most common anemia that we see I mentioned earlier the iron deficiency anemia had uh, cells that were too small, so that was microcytic. Uh, you would also typically see cells that don't have enough hemoglobin, so it would be hypochromic as well. So just a you know quick little thought about the oxygen comparing, carrying capacity. Um, it's influenced by a number of things, right? So um, the red blood cell count. If you had everything normal except you had half as many red cells, you'd carry half as much oxygen. Um, it's also determined by the hematocrit. 
Um, so if you had a hematocrit that was half as much, you'd probably carry about half as much oxygen. And same is true of the hemoglobin. If you had half as much hemoglobin, so instead of having 280 million per cell, you only had 140 million per cell, then you'd carry half the oxygen. So all three of those things can be reasons why uh, you might not be able to carry enough oxygen. And if we can't do that, that's a clinical disease we call anemia. So people that have uh, anemia are called anemics, and they have a reduced ability to carry oxygen. And there's a number of indicators that uh, we see, uh, most often measured by red blood cell count, hemoglobin concentration, or hematocrit. Uh, but also, as I mentioned a few slides ago, that the MCV, the average cell size, mean corpuscular volume, and the MCHC, the average cellular hemoglobin concentration, right? Um, those are also indicators. Uh, so what can cause these problems? There's a number of different things. Um, one is a reduced red blood cell number. Um, there's two ways to do it, and, and I sometimes we don't really think about the second way. The, the first way is decreased production, right? Hey, we don't make enough red blood cells, then we're not going to have the right number of red cells. Uh, but the other one on the other side is destruction or loss. So if we're destroying red blood cells or losing red blood cells through some sort of uh, blood loss event um, or, you know, a series of blood loss, of, loss events like um, a bleeding ulcer, uh, then you can end up having anemia. Uh, it could be that it's the red blood cell number is normal, but you don't have enough hemoglobin, so you just have too little of it. Or it could be that there's a quality problem with your hemoglobin, your hemoglobin is not adequate, and that would be like sickle cell disease or one of the thalassemias you might see. So it can be caused by multiple factors. Um, so there are some of the examples we talked about with reduced number and things like that. Um, so normal red blood size, normal red blood cell size, hemoglobin's less. Uh, decreased production would be dietary deficiencies. You don't have enough iron or vitamin B12 or folic acid. Could be you have some sort of bone marrow disease where you're not functioning well there, or it could be you have an inadequate EPO. Remember, EPO is erythropoietin, and that's the chemical that stimulates the production of red blood cells. Um, it could be you have uh, increased destruction or loss, you have weakened red blood cells, there's a disease called hereditary serocytosis, and it's when you have red blood cells that basically have weakened walls, and normally red blood cells should last three, four months, and in people that have this, this disease, this genetic disease, they don't last nearly that long. Um, or it could be increased blood loss through menstruation or an ulcer, or even a bad case of hemorrhoids uh, could do that. Um, it could be you have insufficient hemoglobin. If you don't have enough iron, you're not going to make hemoglobin, so that could be a problem. Or again, it could be inadequate hemoglobin where you just have sickle cell, like seen here in the bottom right figure. So as I mentioned before, uh, we can characterize anemia by cell size and color. So cell size would be the cytic, right? That tends to be a DNA-based problem. Um, so there's usually an issue with DNA, and if they're too small, it's microcytic. If they're too big, it's macrocytic. And if they're just right, it's like Goldilocks, it would be normocytic. For hemoglobin amount, we use the term chromic. Because hemoglobin is a protein, it's generally an RNA-based problem for that. Um, again, too little hemoglobin is hypochromic. Too much hemoglobin is hyperchromic. And just the right normal amount is normochromic. So anemias uh, are characterized by size and color. So to calculate again the uh, cell size, you use the MCV. And for the hemoglobin amount, you use the MCHC. So I saw before. So um, how would you characterize someone if they had an MCV of 79.8 and an MCHC of 28? Well, since the MCV values, it's not here, but we went over it a second ago, uh, is 82 to 92 is normal for MCV, and we're at 79.8, we're lower than normal. So that would be microcytic. The MCHC is 32 to 36, 
we're at 28, right? So that would be hypochromic. So this person would be characterized by having microcytic hypochromic anemia. Uh, there are a number of anemias that people can have, but by far the most common is the microcytic hypochromic one, which is usually due to iron deficiency. So it's called iron deficiency, unless we know it's caused by some other issue. Um, it could be due to chronic infection as well. Um, when we have a chronic infection, our body sequesters iron in the liver to help fight the infection and basically to keep the iron away from the microorganism that's making you sick. Um, but uh, most of the time it has to do with iron deficiency. You just don't have adequate iron in your diet. Uh, the iron deficiency anemia prevalence, women, like one in five women, so about 20% have iron deficiency anemia. Uh, we often think of it as a disease that so doesn't affect men, but 3% of men have it. Uh, children have it, 20%, typically because of their uh, fast growth weight and often um, inadequate diet. And it really goes up during pregnancy where you see about half of uh, pregnancies uh, result in the mother having iron deficiency anemia. Uh, just as an aside, uh, not every type of anemia though is microcytic hypochromic. Here's an example I mentioned earlier, pernicious anemia. People with pernicious anemia cannot absorb vitamin B12 and vitamin B12 is essential to make red blood cells. So they have um, excessively large cells, so it's macrocytic, and their uh, hemoglobin is normal, so it's normochromic. So that's another type of, relatively not as common nearly as the, the first one, but it's not uncommon type of anemia. So that kind of finishes up 6.1 of Fox. Now we're moving on to 6.3 of Fox. And 6.3 of Fox looks at the red blood cells. And red blood cells, like all cells, have surface antigens. Uh, they're just proteins. And uh, there's literally, you know, 50-something uh, different types of proteins that can be on a red blood cell. And some of those, many of those have subtypes. And so there's literally hundreds of uh, potential proteins on a red cell. And since the protein can cause the body to make antibodies, they're called antigens. Okay? An antigen is just short for antibody generator or antibody generating substance. So we have antigens that we're going to be exposed to, and those substances are going to stimulate an immune response where we form antibodies. Okay? And that antibody would then attack the antigen if it came across it, and it would have an immune response where it basically clumped the antigens together and marked them for destruction, okay? So um, this, these uh, cell surface molecules, which are usually you know, proteins, with, often with carbohydrates attached to them, so they're those glycoproteins that we've talked about in the cell stuff, um, and they give red blood cells a unique identity. Uh, we only really worry about two types of antigens on the surface of red blood cell, uh, what is often known as the ABO grouping and the RH grouping. Uh, the ABO grouping can give you uh, basically four types of blood, type A, type B, type AB, and O. And the RH grouping can either give you what we call RH positive, where you have the protein, or RH negative, where you don't have that specific protein. All right, so where we get these proteins from is they're inherited genetically, right? So genes determine the blood type antigens. Um, the ABO grouping is determined on chromosome number nine, and the RH grouping is determined by chromosome number one, okay? Now, one of the things that I think is kind of important to remember is that uh, you know we have 23 pairs of chromosomes in the human body. So here's what's called a karyotype. A karyotype is just basically uh, accounting for all the chromosomes in the human body. So these rows here, all the way down to right here, except for this one in the middle, oh, sorry, middle, kind of towards the right corner, 
Uh, those are called the auto zones. Notice how they're numbered 1 to 22. And then uh, this one is called the sex chromosomes, and uh, that's the 23rd set. All right, so one set you got from mom and one set you got from dad. And so we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. That's why you see that company that does the genetic stuff for heredity, um, 23 and me, right? Um, because it's hard to rhyme stuff with six, right? Um, even though we have a copy from each parent. Um, so the whole bunch of chromosomes, we call it a karyotype. Now, when we look at specific chromosomes, right, uh, and we look at the two versions of the gene, gene you have, that's called the genotype, right? So what you got from mom and you got from dad says what your genotype is. Now, blood has, uh, the ABO grouping in blood, better to say it, has uh, characteristics that are not classical in terms of genetics. Most of the time, the genetics have a simple dominant and recessive characteristic where the ABO grouping doesn't exhibit that. Uh, a couple other things, and we'll get to that idea in a second, a couple other things about our genes though. Um, we said earlier that the ABO grouping is carried on chromosome number nine. The specific place it's carried, like its address, would be called its locus, right, for location. It's a good way to think about it. Um, and then the version of the gene is called an allele, all right? And for the ABO grouping, there are three basic alleles. Uh, you could have an allele A, which says make the A protein. You could have an allele B that says have the B protein, or you can have an allele O that sort of says have an O protein. Um, so those are the different versions of the gene that we call the allele. Now you get one allele from mom and one allele from dad, so those alleles together are called your genotype. And those genotypes are going to determine what blood type you have. That would be called the phenotype. Okay? So the genotype is the combination of genes. Since there are three different combinations of genes, that we have uh, a number of, oh, sorry, three different combinations of alleles. We have a number of different genotypes that we can pair up. If both parents said have type A blood, you'd have AA, right? That would give you blood type A, so you have a phenotype of A. But you could also have one parent say have type A blood, and the other parent say, hey, have type O. O has a recessive characteristic where uh, if uh, you have one of the other types, it'll mask the O one. Uh, without getting into too much detail, uh, the alleles for A and B and O, uh, they all start out with the same glycoprotein. And at the end of O, there's no extra um, sugar unit, basically. On When you have A, type A blood, the, the, the A allele, uh, you would have a protein that looks exactly like the O1, but at the end you have an extra little sugar unit at the end. And the B looks very similar to A, except at the very end it has a slightly different sugar unit. So they're all proteins that we can see, and they all have the basic O setup, and if they have an extra one, it's an A, and if they have an extra different one, it's a B. So it's pretty simple. Um, and those combinations uh, of genotypes give you different blood types. So what makes this kind of uh, interesting, and in some cases hard to, to determine stuff, is I have type A blood. I have no idea, and as a physiologist, I'm maybe a little embarrassed to say this, but uh, I have no idea whether my genotype is AA or AO. Now, I haven't looked at my kids' blood types or my parents' blood types hard enough to uh, figure it out, and, you know, it could be possible to figure out based on, on different things um, if you make some assumptions. But uh, that blood type could have two genotypes. So if you have type A blood, we don't know what genotype you have. So what genes do you have? Same with type B, where you could have the BB or BO designation. Um, the other two blood types are pretty easy, though. Um, interestingly enough, the A protein or the B protein doesn't mask the other. So if you have... Um, an allele for one, you're going to express it uh, no matter what. 
Um, so in the case of someone with the AB genotype, the only blood type they can have is AB. So if you have a blood type AB, that's your phenotype, that's the way you look, blood type AB, we know your genotype has to be AB. So you had to get an A allele from one parent and a B allele from another parent. Now, if your blood type is type O, then we know your genotype as well, because it means you don't have an A or a B allele, which means the only alleles you could have would be O and O. So it's kind of the easiest way to think about it, and we kind of see where that genetically comes from. So as I said before, blood type is inherited from your parent, and it's kind of a, you know an interesting way to look at it. So here's the father that has type A blood. Here's their, his alleles. He has an A allele and an O allele. Now, um, during meiosis and fertilization, they're random uh, which allele gets uh, and becomes part of the fertilized egg uh, is random. And so there's a 50% chance that dad's going to give an A to an offspring allele and a 50% dad's going to be the O offspring to his uh, offspring, uh, the O allele to his offspring. And let's say mom is uh, type B blood, and she has the B allele and the O allele. So the same thing goes for mom. She has a 50% chance to give the B allele, the green one, to her offspring, and a 50% chance to give the O allele. And so when you combine the chances, you can see that there's a 25% chance the baby's going to be A, and a 25% chance the baby's going to be AB, 25% chance the baby's going to be BO, and a 25% chance the baby's going to be O. So, oh, oh. so uh, we have an A, an AB, a B, and an O blood. So, um, you know, knowing the genetics and the alleles of parents really help determine what the blood types of the offspring can be. Before we had fancy genetic testing with DNA analysis and things like that, uh, Heredity was sometimes, like paternity lawsuits, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago, were determined by blood type. And the problem is there's so many people with certain types of blood, it was very difficult to say, oh, he's the father or he's, because just because, you know, the dad's got type O blood and the baby's got type O blood doesn't mean dad wasn't the father, doesn't mean dad was the father. Uh, but... If dad had AB blood and the baby had type O blood, then you say, okay, there's no way dad has that allele. He doesn't have an O allele, so he couldn't be the father. So that's kind of uh, how it looks at. I find this much easier than this. So this one was one way to, to kind of separate it out. Here's another way. These are called Punnett squares, and I find these are the easiest. So you take the blood type from one parent, and, you know, by convention, the woman is on the left and the man's on the top, but it doesn't really matter because it's going to be a square anyway. And you put the two alleles, so the genotype for mom, so the B goes here and the O goes here. And then you do the same thing for dad, so the A goes here and the O goes here. And then you just move them across or down appropriately. So this B goes into this box and this box. This O goes into this box and this box. This A goes into this box in that box and this O goes into this box and that box and so once you do that now you see again for much easier I think that there's a possibility of being A B B A or O so you should know how to do those Punnett squares so here's an example of you know two parents that are A B and you would think oh then the child should be A B but if you look at it and you do a Punnett square, you say, okay, here's mom's, an A and a B, and dad, an A and a B. And then you move the two A's, the A, B here, the A, B here, and the two B's. You see that there's only a 50% chance the child's going to be A, B, and there's a 25% chance the baby's going to be A, and a 25% chance the baby's going to be B. But as you can see here, there's no possible way the baby would be O. So... Why do we care about this? Well, this matters in a medical situation because of transfusion. And what's kind of interesting is um, if you have type A blood, 
right? Like I have type A blood. Um, I have these, and they're represented by these blue antigens on the surface of my blood cell. And I naturally make antibodies. So antibodies against type B blood. And someone with B blood would make antibodies against type A. Someone with AB blood wouldn't make any antibodies, right? Because otherwise they would attack themselves. Someone with O blood, because they don't have any of the uh, antigens, they're going to make antibodies against type A and type B blood. And it's these antibodies that we worry about in terms of transfusion. Okay? So if we transfuse blood that's not the right blood type then we're going to get something called agglutination and that's clumping of the red blood cells together and that's to mark them for um, attack by the immune system okay so agglutination can block small blood vessels it's not clotting but it can result in a, a lot of issues so you have to make sure you have compatible blood types okay and the compatible blood types are pretty simple okay um, <clears throat> if you have type A blood you can always get your own blood and type O so A can get A and O type B blood can get B and O type AB can get A B A B and O because they don't have any antibodies and type O can only get O all right now we don't worry too much about the donors' antibodies in their plasma, but we usually try to match the best we can in terms of that. And we'll see that if you look here, and it's different across the world. In the U.S., about 44% of the people are O and about 42% are A. So 85% over uh, people in the U.S. are A and O. About 10% are type B and about 4% are type AB. So um, that's, you know, we see a lot of A and O people. Uh, since AB can get all the blood types, right, that's called the universal acceptor. Since everybody can get O, notice O's in every column, right, that's called the universal donor. All right, so some people like this where you go O, A, B, and AB at the bottom with the arrows all pointing down. So O can give it to everybody and A and O can give it to AB and O and B can give it to AB and AB can give it to itself. Um, but that's a good way to remember it as well. But I, I just think, you know, you always get your own blood and, oh, you should be okay. Now, the other uh, one we're worried about is the RH factor. Uh, and the RH factor, it's just a different protein on the surface. This one's a little simpler, though, in many ways, because there's only uh, two, two possibilities. You either get the allele that says make the protein or you get the allele that does say don't make the protein right and so that means there's only a couple combinations you could have both alleles that say make the protein and if you do you're said to be rh positive you could have one allele to make the protein and one not since the allele to make the protein is the dominant one then you're going to be rh positive as well and if you have both alleles that say don't make the protein you'll be rh negative uh, in the u.s it's almost about 90 percent of the people are rh positive and only about 10% are Rh negative. Uh, this is the uh, one of the first space monkeys, right? And uh, so here they're getting them ready for, for space travel. Uh, and it was uh, first discovered on the rhesus monkeys, and that's why we see the Rh or rhesus. The genetic pattern is the same in terms of that. And here's an interesting one where we have an RH positive mom and an RH positive dad, but they're both uh, have alleles that are both positive and negative. And so you see that there is a 75% chance the offspring will be RH positive. And there's a 25% chance our offspring will be RH negative. So again, you set up the same exact Punnett square to do that. Now, in terms of the RH factor, we don't naturally make antibodies against the RH. So if you have RH positive, you can get transfusion of RH positive and RH negative blood. If you're RH negative, though, you have to get transfusion of RH positive blood. If you, sorry, RH negative blood. So RH negative can only get RH negative. Um, if you get RH positive blood, you don't naturally have antibodies. That's the first time isn't a big deal. But what happens is then it stimulates the production of antibodies so that if you get exposed a second time 
or a subsequent time, then that's going to cause an immune reaction and it's going to be uh, not a good reaction in terms of that. And the place you most worry about that is uh, when you have an RH negative woman and an RH positive man have a child. Okay? Now, there's a decent chance, depending on dad's uh, alleles, that the offspring is going to be RH positive. If the offspring is RH positive and mom's RH negative, uh, when the baby's born, the maternal and fetal blood mix. And what happens is mom makes antibodies against the RH positive blood. So the first baby's okay because it's out and not exposed to those antibodies because it takes mom a while to, to build them up. But if you're baby number two now and during delivery where blood could mix easily between mom and baby, then the RH uh, positive blood in the baby will mix with mom's antibodies and cause a reaction. Okay, That's called hemolytic disease of the newborn. Uh, used to a long time ago, we called it erythroblastosis fatalis. But hemolytic disease of the newborn, or HDN, is very common. And one of the big reasons is that it causes jaundice. And jaundice uh, is excessive bilirubin. And uh, it has to do with the red blood cell destruction during uh, this transfer. Uh, but uh, this is an unretouched uh, photo. So this is just, you know, nothing's happened to it. You can see how yellow the baby is uh, because of that. So that's where we see it uh, a big deal. Um, because it was so potentially dangerous uh, in the 60s, scientists invented um, uh, something called Rogam. And what Rogam does, it's an injection that mom gets at various times during pregnancy and after delivery that complexes the uh, antibodies and basically uh, destroys the, the cells so that they don't have a reaction now. And so now that high risk pregnancy is not nearly as high risk. So here's a nice summary of what you can get. And if you look here, then, um, sorry, uh, the true universal donor then would be O negative, right? Because anybody can get O negative blood because it's got no antigens whatsoever for your immune system to read and react with. The true universal recipient then would be AB positive because they could literally get any blood uh, because they don't, ha they have literally every antigen on the cell surface. So that was the red blood cell lab, uh, lab 22 with Fox 6.1 and 6.3.